Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce Kat Ullman, who is going to talk about openness and science at Google. Thank you very much. How's that? Much better. Alrighty then. Um, as an earlier speaker said, I'm not Australian, so if you find my accent difficult to comprehend, or if I'm talking too quickly, though arguably I may talk too slowly, um, I don't know, wave your arms, gesture frantically, etc. cetera. Thanks. Um, I am Kat Allman. I am at Google. I'm on two teams, uh, the open source and the making and science team. The obligatory, um, Disclaimer, first of all, thank you for having me. I haven't been to LCA since 2011 in Brisbane, and I always love coming to this conference. But as you know, it's a, uh, a bit of a schlep, as we say, to get over here. So it's a treat to get to come back, especially here in Hobart, which is ridiculously beautiful. I'm sure it's like this every day, right? <laughs> okay. Um, the disclaimer is the standard, these are my opinions. Um, however, I add, start out saying the talk is about science at Google. Um, so obviously there's going to be stuff about Google in there, so we're gonna parse this. If it's a fact, okay, that's uh, certified by Google. But if it's a random philosophical musing or silly ass opinion, it's mine, don't blame them. And if you can't tell the difference, talk to me after the talk. So a bit about me. Um, my history in open source goes back long before the term. Um, Mount Zainu, for those of you that uh, flip back and forth in your reading capabilities, that stands for Unix trademark backwards. Uh, we were the first commercially supported version of BSD Unix about the time AT&T pitched a little legal fit about things. Um, it was a very interesting time and there's a very interesting and thorough, we won't say long, we'll say thorough talk about it um, that you can find on the internet about what that was like for the BSD community at the time. Um, so that was then, and then I worked in design and marketing in IT management and user support I've worked at two, technically two and a half startups. And then I worked at Usenix, the Advanced Computing Systems Association. And from there, I went to Google, where I have been since 2007, having a wonderful time. Um, I don't know about the tech industry in Australia, but in Silicon Valley, I occasionally get um, snarky remarks and incredulous horror that I've been with the same company for almost 10 years. But the truth is, they pay me a pretty decent amount to get to come to places like this, so why the heck would I leave? <laughs> so why am I here? Well, because of the aforementioned dual role. I should mention right off the bat, my role at Google is in outreach, and I'm going to be talking about things like uh, machine intelligence. I know nothing about the technical aspects of those. I can give you resources where you can find out, and hey, it's open source, so you can find out all about it and poke at it to your heart's content. Um, that said, if there would be questions, if you wouldn't mind saving them for the end, I'd appreciate it. It's the first time I've given, given this deck, and I'm a little bit nervous, so be gentle. So the open source team, um, I and two of my four colleagues are here from the outreach side. We do Google Summer of Code. Has anybody not heard of Google Summer of Code? Yes. <laughs> we also have our high school version, Google Code In. Uh, we're just wrapping up with that. If you know any teenagers who might be interested in getting involved with um, open source coding, Please have them take a look at Google Code in uh, around December, November, December of this coming year. We got the budget, so we're going to be doing it again. So it's okay for me to talk about it ahead of time. 
Um, we also do things like sponsor projects and community events, such as LinuxConf AU. Um, internally, we do evangelism, education, and support. Um, for example, we have a new community manager for Go inside of Google, and he needed to know where we had gotten these amazing little um, vinyl figurines of the Go gopher. And apparently, I'm one of two people in the company that has the contact at a company called Dead Zebra that makes these things. <laughs> so there's the random on the one hand, but on the other hand, we also provide advice to other people and groups in the company on how to open source their code, why they would want to open source their code, um, community building, wide variety of things. Um, and then there's this whole other chunk of the open source team that works on license review and compliance. At Google, we take software licensing extremely seriously. And I'm not just saying that because Karen Sandler is in the audience. <laughs> now, we have a whole team of people, including what we refer to as NG lawyers, people who are both practicing engineers and well-qualified lawyers. Uh, Karen is not the only one. Uh, to look at all the code coming into the company, be it because an engineer wants to use it or because of an acquisition or potential acquisition, as well as making sure all this, the code that we release is licensed appropriately. And lots more, but that's enough. The Making and Science team is a relatively new team. About two and a half years ago, Larry Page, one of our founders, um, Larry's a big Maker Faire fan. Like, this year he came to Maker Faire two days, one day with his kids, and the next day by himself so he could geek out and ask all kinds of questions without his relatively small kids getting bored. Um, he wanted to make sure that Google had programs about science that were done for engineers and by engineers. So we've got a, a small but mighty team um, there's an engineering side and an outreach side. We do a variety of things. Um, the maker spaces, turns out Googlers left alone with company credit cards will do things like buy laser printers, kind of do-it-yourself, unlicensed laser printers, and drag them into the office. Um, apparently, you can actually buy a laser, uh, laser cutter from China that is heavy enough that it will start to bow a floor in a Silicon Valley type of office, <laughs> and it exhausts toxic fumes into an adjacent cubicle area, which is not really a good idea. So um, we have uh, kind of one and a half people who work on making sure that there's a maker space in every Google office and data center where there are Googlers who commit to being appropriate stewards and uh, not poisoning anybody or crushing them under large pieces of equipment. Um, we do a variety of sponsorships, including um, research on STEM education. We're very interested, well, our motto for the team is making new scientists. Waha. Um, so we do a lot of work around uh, improving STEM education and access to STEM education. The United States is going to be lucky enough to have a total solar eclipse transiting the middle of the country next, uh, well, this coming August. So we're doing a big program with that with both amateur and professional photographers and amateur and professional astronomers around science outreach, but also documenting and creating what we call, um, what will be called mega movie, so that scientists have a going to be about an hour and 15 minute film of the totality as it moves across the center of the country. Should be pretty fun. Um, we sponsor lots of fast, uh, first robotics, including the Asia Pac semifinal in Australia through our Sydney office. We we're pretty jazzed about that. Uh, we also make sure that we don't just sponsor the big things, but rather we provide money to uh, every first team where there is a Google parent who's either a parent of a child and or a mentor to the team. Um, 
then we get to do fun things like science foo camp and education foo. That's the majority of what I do with this team is working on foo camps, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but if you're curious, come and find me after. And then science journal, and there'll be more about that later. So moving on. What is science? Well, we all know that science is a mysterious and potentially dangerous thing done by men in lab coats in secret lairs. <laughs> Surely, I mean, <laughs> but no, actually, science is from the Latin word that means knowledge. And depending on who you want to argue with over dinner, science is actually just about discovering more knowledge in a systematic and methodical and reproducible set of practices, arguably. The scientific method, any of us who've taken probably any science class in high school are familiar with the scientific method. This is what I mean by a reproducible process. You make an observation, you think about how you could examine whether or not what's making these, what you're observing happen, formulate the hypothesis, which becomes an experiment. You gather data. You look and see if your hypothesis is either correct or incorrect, or perhaps your data collection is flawed, and develop a theory, and so on and so on. Much like software, science is an iterative process. You begin over and over again to just keep looping along and making things better. And so, what is open? For those of you who don't recognize the gentleman in the corner, that's Richard Stallman, the author of The Four Freedoms. Um, notice I've been saying open source, he says free. Uh, but in any event, there is the theory that open source is, uh, was begun by Richard. And with all due respect to a very brilliant man who's done a lot, I personally think the concept of open, which we now use in the context of science and technology, is a much, much older idea. If I were going to make the rules, I would potentially blame, or at least credit, Sir Isaac Newton when he said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. For me, the whole concept of open is simply, or not so simply, that we all build on the work of others. Knowledge is cumulative. It, it grows in an almost geologic process of layers accreting upon layers and building it, whether you want to think of it as sedimentary deposits or rings on a tree. Um, open is all about sharing knowledge to create more knowledge. Again, my opinion. So open science is the combination of the two. You've got knowledge and you have sharing. It is both a concept and a practice. The practice feeds the concept and vice versa. Um, I really like these four goals, though some people would argue that these are not the only or the correct goals of open science or methodologies of open science. But I mean, we're all in the open community and we all love to argue about stuff. So save that for another dinner conversation. For me, at least, it's transparency, public availability of data, accessibility of the scientific communication. Anyone here in academia? You may be familiar with uh, firewalled publications. And using web-based and or open source tools to facilitate the furtherance of science activities. Um, and this is where I'm going to scoot over and look at my notes. Ah. Anyway, nothing useful there. So moving on. <laughs> open science at Google. Um, I, some of you may have heard me say this, I liken Google to a clown car. You know, at the circus, there's a little tiny car and all these clowns come pouring out. A clown car looks like a single discrete object on the outside, but it's filled, it's seething with all these amazing things that just come pouring out at random intervals. 
may not be the most flattering description of the company, but as someone who constantly has family members at holiday dinners coming up and saying, wow, I heard that Google did thus and such. And I'm like, really? We did? I, a lot of what I find out about the company I read in the newspaper on dead trees, even. Lots going on. So I'm going to talk about four things in particular. Who here has heard of TensorFlow? Oh, awesome. You guys get up here and give the rest of the talk. <laughs> TensorFlow is, um, it came out of our Google Brain group, which in turn came out of our machine intelligence group. It originally was developed um, as kind of a back end for our translation features. Um, I, I meant to check. I didn't. I think Google Translate now automatically works on something on the order of 80 different languages, pretty much at the blink of an eye. And while there are the occasional comical errors, we'll say, um, in general, it's pretty amazing what happens. And TensorFlow is the guts of the engine behind it. Um, we open sourced it in November of 2015. For those of you that are interested in learning more about it, there's all kinds of resources now online, um, online classes. There's actually the first TensorFlow conference coming up. It is a fully externalized open source project. Go to tensorflow.org. And um, if you are interested in it, please check it out, poke at the code, do cool things with it. Um, if you do end up doing cool things with it, please let us know. You'll get my email address in the end. Um, we, by we, I mean to point out another colleague of mine right there, he runs the Google Open Source blog, and we're always interested in stories about how people are using code open sourced by Google. So that would be tools. And then there's open access. I mentioned um, firewalled publication. Google internally has a policy since 2013 of encouraging our researchers to always publish on open access uh, venues, such as Public Library of Science. Um, we do not require it because Sometimes people don't want to for whatever reason. Maybe the top journal in their particular niche field isn't open access. So then what we do is we pay um, to lift the embargo so that that paper is available more often. And or um, in a couple of cases, like with Usenix, we sponsor open access for all Usenix papers on an annual basis so that, because a lot of Googlers publish at Usenix venues. Um, we do what we can following the law, respecting people's rights, to make sure that scientific information is available freely to the public. Which brings me to Google Scholar. If you haven't poked at it, it's so fun. It's basically one-stop shopping for all the publicly available scientific publications and patents and case law relating to them. So it's, it's all the strength and power of the Google search engine applied to really technical stuff. I would encourage you um, to poke around just because you can find really interesting things in there. In addition, on the open access front, we have the Google Research Blog. Um, like most technology companies, we have large research departments. Um, there's a lot of applied research being done, as you might expect in that kind of a situation. But there is also uh, primary research being done. And whenever possible, we talk about it in the Google Research Blog. In addition, you can find out about code we're open sourcing on the open source blog. Generally, those are chunks of code from other parts of the company besides research that we do on occasion, I believe, do cross posts. Am I right? OK, cool. Open tools. Since you all know what Summer of Code is, I will spare you all that. In 2016, we had 180 open source projects as chosen as mentoring orgs. 
43 of those self-identified as being science-related in the tags that they made available to students to help students find a project of interest to them. Obviously, there are not 43 names up there, and honestly, I don't know how legible that is, but they range from things that I'm sure we've all heard of, like CERN, to um, OpenMRS, Public Lab is pretty interesting, um, all kinds of things. And then there's things on there like Python, there are subunits within Python around scientific computation. I didn't leave R on there, but that's used quite a bit in science. So if, you, um, if you're part of an open source project aimed at the scientific community, or actually if you're part of an open source project that isn't aimed at the scientific community, we're coming up very soon on the opening of the application period for mentoring organizations for 2017 GSOC. Sorry? Thursday, very soon, okay, because you got nothing else to do for the rest of this week besides put together an application. Um, we would, we always like to see new orgs apply. It's an opportunity for you to raise the profile publicly of your project, and um, the long-range goal is to gain new contributors. So uh, if not this year, maybe next. And then we have the Making in Science initiative. I talked about that a little bit, so I'm gonna skip this slide and go straight to Science Journal. I mentioned we have a small engineering team as part of the Making in Science group. Um, their first code and hardware-based project is something we call Science Journal. It basically takes stock Android phones and uses the sensors built into them, plus, if you want, external sensors routed through an Arduino to collect data, serve as an online uh, science journal to conduct experiments, compare data. We worked a great deal with the Exploratorium, which if you ever get to the San Francisco Bay Area, it is an insanely fun science and creativity interactive museum. You may actually have played with Exploratorium exhibits in other science museums around the world, because unbeknownst to me, they make the majority of their money by crafting exhibits and teaching materials, which are used by science museums all over the world. And they were wonderful with us because we got started as a project and sat in a meeting room at the Exploratorium with their uh, instructional design experts, and we're talking about Arduinos and how everybody has an extra CPU in their garage by their soldering iron. And the very nice people at the Exploratorium did not actively mock us, but they did kind of grab the string and pull the balloon down to earth and suggest that no, everybody on the world does not have a soldering iron and extra Arduinos, even if they have a garage. So they were great about helping us build this tool on low-end phones, and the experiments are done with things like straws, paper straws, pipe cleaners, paper cups. You can buy prepackaged kits of the materials. The software is, of course, online for free, open source, et cetera. Um, you can buy a kit with all the materials, or the bill of materials is available, and you can assemble it yourself at a very low cost. And we've had pretty good uptake on it. Um, a lot of enthusiasm from science teachers. There's some really wonderful things going on in improving STEM ed, particularly in kind of K through fifth grade, so like um, five-year-olds through about 12-year-olds, though a lot of this stuff seems more aimed at um, teenagers. The little kids get so excited. It's really neat to see them discover things like acceleration when they can measure it on something that they've made themselves and see the data. It's super cool. And this is an example of some of the screens on the app. We tried to make it uh, easily understandable, peppy, cheerful colors, all those good things. So what else do we do? Um, you've probably heard of Google X and the self-driving car. X has one of the 
spun out groups that's now under the alphabet umbrella. Um, there's Calico. The uh, clickbaity way of describing Calico is that it's conquering aging. What it really is is a life science research team working on conquering the bad parts of aging, the parts we'd all like to skip, like Alzheimer's. Uh, Google Life Science is uh, more functionally focused on medicine. Have anybody heard of the contact lenses? Okay, they've got two people who heard of them. It's crazy for um, diabetics. They have created contact lenses where the power to do continuous monitoring of insulin levels is caused by the chemical reaction in human tears. Yeah, it's amazing. And no, it does not have like a AAA battery stuck out of one corner of your eye. It's amazing. Um, they're working on it with a third party optical science company now, but it was one of those things where I was just like jumping up and down at the company meeting because I couldn't believe how cool that was. Um, Makani is our alternative energy spin out. Those of you who are from New Zealand may have seen a Project Loon balloon flying overhead. I see one thumbs up. We had one in um, the central area of our campus. Uh, does anybody remember the television program, The Prisoner? Okay, if you, there was that giant balloon where if you tried to escape the village, the giant balloon would come bouncing across. And, it's like that, except it's a lot bigger. <laughs> and that, no, it does not generate energy by absorbing wrongdoers. It, <laughs> but it is very cool. And all kinds of other things. I'm really curious to see what X keeps coming up with. And this is the part that I've really been looking forward to. My favorite part. Any of you who don't know XKCD, I thoroughly encourage you. The man's science is good, and he's so sarcastic. I just love him. So these are four examples of uh, science and making that personally I think are doing really tremendous things to engage all of us, be us lab coat wearers or not, in the process of science. So with no further ado, I was really surprised. I mean, obviously, computers are everywhere and in all the sciences. But what I didn't know is that as computers have become ubiquitous to the practice of science, there are lots and lots of scientists who are not necessarily computer literate and find themselves relying on proprietary software to do their experiments, which oftentimes is to my mind, shockingly expensive. So there's a gentleman by the name of Greg, I'm gonna say Wilson, if I'm wrong. That, that was one of those things you don't blame Google for. Software carpentry. It's been around since 2011, and the whole idea is recruiting um, open source literate people to run workshops for scientists in academic settings to teach them enough about open source that they can use open source tools instead of expensive proprietary tools. As you can see with 16,000 learners, and that number is actually from, I think, July of last year. If you are with an academic institution and you think this would be useful, come find me afterwards. I'd be happy to connect you with Greg. So far, most of the uh, workshops have been in Canada the US, the UK, and a couple of other places in Western Europe. But um, I will go out on a limb and say, I'll bet Greg would like to come to Australia. So we'll see. Um, very useful and inspiring to see people um, seizing on open source in this context. And as we all know, funding for scientific basic research it's not so great, so if we can lower the cost of doing science, so much the better. Squishy circuits, that was university, now we're talking about not toddlers, but like first and second graders. A good friend of mine, Anne-Marie Thomas, is um, she's both a marine scientist, a physicist, 
and she teaches at the University of St. Thomas on engineering education and circus arts. She's pretty interesting. Well, she figured out a way to make Play-Doh. Do you have Play-Doh in this? Okay. To make at home Play-Doh that is super cheap, non-toxic, and electrically conductive. So as to teach kids basic principles about electricity using modeling clay. Um, she has open sourced the formula. You can find it online. She does have a little do-it-yourself company where you get a box and it's got light up diodes and this and that, or you can just put it together yourself. One thing you can't do is take this stuff on an airplane, at least in the US. Because apparently, if you try and check a bag that's got a big lump of what <laughs> appears to be plastic explosives, the <clears throat> government people get, let's just say, your flight is going to be delayed. So, But if you uh, have little kids and you want to teach them about electricity, it's super fun. This is something that I was really jazzed about as part of making and science. We were able to be um, the primary funder of an effort by the Wikipedia organization to, um, well, here, I'll start at the beginning. Wikipedia, who here has students or as a student has used Wikipedia as a source of information for your schoolwork? Okay, a few sheepish hands and some not so sheepish hands. Wikiedu.org is a spin-off from Wikipedia where they felt that, as what a wise man said, it's easier to ride the horse the direction it's going. Rather than having teachers and professors struggle against students using Wikipedia, why not embrace that and use Wikipedia and, more importantly, the creation of data in Wikipedia as a teachable moment? Instead of having the final product of a student's work be a term paper, which will then go and live in their parents' basement or garage, instead, why don't they generate Wikipedia content? In particular, um, there was a pretty shocking dearth of information about female scientists in Wikipedia. I mean, there's holes throughout it and exhaustive information about other things. But basically, Wikipedia EDU came up with an instructional framework for professors to engage their classes in doing documented and well-written articles on um, science of whatever kind, but with a special emphasis on increasing the information about women science, scientists in 2016. Um, this effort has had a couple of um, happy side products. 90% um, of general Wikipedia editors are men, but this effort has brought it up to more than 65% in the educational content generated by the students. They're pretty excited about that. It's also been a lab for Wikipedia to try out a um, sandboxed model of content editing. Is that even a word? Editing? Yeah, editing. Thank you. Um, you may have heard about um, edit wars in Wikipedia and people getting a little uh, hyper aggressive about defending their point of view. Uh, this program uses a sandbox so that students can work with their professors to improve their communication skills without having, uh, we'll say, political discussions online about the veracity of their content. Um, in April of this last year, the program, this particular program had been running four months. 9% of new scientific content generated in Wikipedia English language came as a result of this program. It's had an extraordinary impact. Thank you. And while it is specifically focused for now on uh, the US, I'm itching them very strongly to expand. And since they're working on English language content, and there are other countries besides the US where people speak English, this content and the program could very easily be adapted to other places. 
And if you're in a situation of being a classroom teacher and this seems like a useful thing, as we all know, um, documentation of one kind or another doesn't necessarily get the respect it could stand to have, but communication skills are increasingly important in terms of funding. And this program not only increases the scientific content, but it increases the communication skills of the participating students. In other words, I think it's terrific and you should all check it out. And I'm in Australia, so I have to talk about sharks. Isn't that like a law when you come into the airport? <laughs> Got to talk about something dangerous that lives in Australia. Citizen science, we've had at least one, two speakers in this track today talk about citizen science projects. Um, this is one, turns out off the eastern coast of the United States, there is a long expanse of sand underwater that is extremely rich in fossils. And it's a huge area and it's sand. I have a visual aid. Someplace, I have a visual aid. There it is, okay. Shark Finder is a way to engage students, children of all ages, in finding their very own dinosaur. These paleontologists, these paleontologists put together kits, very low cost. You get a vial of sand. You get a Petri dish for sorting through things. You get a magnifying glass and forceps. And online, they've got detailed information about what in, what's useful, what they want to see, what they're hoping you'll find versus the stuff that's just sand or old seaweed or something. So unlike those rather large teeth, we're talking very small. I do not expect any of you to be able to identify any of the teeth in this very small vial. I've had people say, you went home and you sorted through sand. It, it is kind of picky, but you know, most of us are coders and we like meticulous, detail-oriented stuff, right? Besides which, like most kids, I was fascinated by dinosaurs and by going through four of these vials, I personally found fossil evidence of five previously unknown species of sharks and rays. So this whole program is all about using the enthusiasm of little kids for dinosaurs to sort through fossil bearing media, which otherwise is out of the reach of this group of paleontologists at the University of Maryland and finding new species. And it's worked brilliantly. And I personally think it's tremendous fun. And it's been a really terrific example of citizen science. Um, our outgoing US president, Barack Obama, is a huge fan of citizen science. He has had citizen science days and um, he actually had a maker fair at the White House. Uh, and this particular project is one that he called out as being particularly effective and engaging for kids. And so if you have a kid or are a kid, um, please do check it out online. So to recap, open science. Science at Google. It's all about knowledge, about expanding the scope of human knowledge and making it organized and universally accessible, to coin a phrase, not. I really think that what's great about open in general is that it does expand the world. Um, and not just because I get to travel around the world and meet fascinating and very intelligent people, but because the work we all do, the play we all do, moves the species forward. And so I encourage us all to keep going. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Cap. That was a great talk. Do we have any questions? We've got about 10 minutes, almost. Anybody want to look at the teeth? <laughs> no questions? Not yet. They, I'm, I'm hoping. They sent me a certificate. They were very sweet about it. But um, at this point, it's in the hands of the senior paleontologists. And as we know, sometimes the sands of science grind slowly. So <laughs> maybe someday. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, if something occurs to you in the middle of the night, send me an email. Don't call me. But, or find me later in the week. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Kat. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to come back. <laughs> We've got about